It is now my privilege to welcome our speaker for this evening, the very Reverend Proto-Presbyter Thomas Hopko. Father Thomas is a Dean Emeritus and former professor of dogmatic theology at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary. Father Thomas is well known to us through his teaching, his books, his many articles, and also through the many talks and lectures he has given over the years. His four-volume work on the Orthodox faith has been seen by all of us and is now translated into more than a dozen languages. This evening, Father Thomas will address the topic, Made Perfect Through Suffering, on Christ's humiliation and human deification. Please joining me, join me in welcoming Father Thomas Hopko. Your eminences, uh, fathers, brothers, sisters, Christ is risen. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me this evening um, to present uh, some thoughts on the topic of uh, the divine humanity of Christ, particularly uh, the issue of the divine humiliation and the human deification in Jesus. In this program, it has the title, Made Perfect uh, Through Suffering. And then the subtitle was on Christ's humiliation and human deification. Uh, you see that the um, text there, uh, that Christ was made perfect through what he suffered, comes from the letter to the Hebrews. You have that sentence not only in the second 2.10 there, but in the fifth chapter, in the uh, eighth uh, verse of that letter to the Hebrews, which is a very important epistle for our topic tonight. It says the following, <clears throat> Although he was son, kaper hos hios, although he was the son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And it's very nice in Greek. It rhymes. Emathen, aphon, epathen. He learned obedience, he, pakoin, through what he suffered. And then it says, and, and I think we can add what's missing there, thereby, because of this, he was perfected. He became perfect. That's a very important word for tonight. Teleothes, he became perfect. He was perfected. And then it says, and so he became to all those who obey him the source of unending salvation. And so he became the source of everlasting salvation to those who obey him. Now, in order to, <clears throat> to treat this subject, it's necessary for us <clears throat> to discuss, to say some things about the main conviction about Jesus that we Orthodox Catholic Christians hold and maintain and defend. <clears throat> Christians who accept the dogmatic definitions of the ecumenical councils as really accurate interpretations of the Holy Scripture, believe that Jesus Christ is both God and man. We confess that Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, is human, man, exactly the way that we are. Exactly. This is a statement of the Council of Chalcedon. Nicaea says that Jesus is divine exactly as God is, that he is homoousios, of one essence with the Father. Chalcedon says that he is also of the same nature, the same essence, the same humanity as we all share. So we confess that Jesus is true God and true man, perfect God, perfect man, really and truly divine, really and truly human, being one person, the Lord Jesus. God's Son, who is begotten of the Father before all ages, in the creed, light from light, true God from true God, and also the one who is born of the Virgin Mary without the human father. And we know also in our Eastern Rite, we sing hymns of this nature. For example, the third tone, 
dogmatic of Saturday Night Vespers, it says about Jesus that he is begotten of the Father eternally, apatoro, and born of Mary, amitoro, <laughs> without a father and without a mother. See, that he was born from the Father eternally, besmatire, uh, and as a um, man, bez uh, otsa, sina plotiu, born as the son of the Father in the flesh. Now, what I would like to do tonight is to try to, in, the, in this brief period of time that we have, is to try to <clears throat> explain a bit, meditate a bit, on <clears throat> how we understand that Jesus is both God and man. How do we understand that he is both divine and human? How does his divinity relate to his humanity? How does his being really a man relate to his being really God? Uh, how uh, does this work in his actual life on this earth, in his ministry, in his being the messianic prophet, the messianic priest, the messianic king? And therefore then, how does this work uh, in our lives where we believe that we, uh, by faith and by grace, are commanded and called and created and saved by God to be exactly what Jesus is. <laughs> to be by grace everything that Christ himself is by nature, and we might even say by his two natures. <laughs> by his nature as divine and his nature as human. Now actually, in the history of theology, there are not too many uh, attempts at making this explanation positively. As a matter of fact, it is affirmed everywhere, but it is very often not really explained or how it's existentially realized in our actual life, how it was existentially realized in the actual life of Jesus himself, Jesus of Nazareth, begotten of all age, before all ages from the Father, born as a man without human father from Mary. How did it work? How, does it, how did it work in him and how does it work in us? And... and, and uh, um, uh, what is it that we have to see here? You know, for example, the Council of Chalcedon that said that Jesus is teleos theos, means perfect ma God, and teleos anthropos, perfect man. And then it says that this divinity and humanity are united in him, and it uses four adverbs in Greek. Um, as, uh, <coughs> the aretos, Achoristos, asinhitos, and atreptos, which means without separation or division, inseparably and indivisibly, and without fusion, without confusion, as we sometimes say even in our church stikiri, and without change, atreptos, without changing. He remains divine, he remains human, the two are not fused together, but they are united inseparably and indivisibly. Now this horos, this definition, it's a, it's a kind of a bounding of the mystery by saying what it is not. But it doesn't very much say to us what it is, how it is. And so uh, what I'm going to have boldness to do tonight is to try to say a little bit, what does it mean positively? You see, how does it work positively? And um, I am uh, 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 emboldened to try to do this um, uh, for... Um, uh, several reasons. <laughs> One is just, I just want to try to do it. Um, it. I and Father Bobby Carl, we take challenges. <clears throat> Father Bob's my cousin. We have the same great-grandparents. Um, but I also want to do it because honestly, I think that most people don't understand it. I honestly believe that most people don't understand. Most people don't think about it much. But as a matter of fact, when they do, when they speak, even when the priests preach, sometimes I honestly have to say, I don't think they get it right. Or not accurate enough. Akrivos, accurately. So I think, I think it could help to try to refine our, our understanding here. It will help. Um, and I think also... Because when you don't get it right, 
then the application in our life is not right. <laughs> you see, if the vision is not correct, then the practical application, the praxis can't be correct either. And just as an example of this, I remember once in my first parish, I was trying to convince a person to forgive someone. And I tried everything I could do. And then finally I said to this person, you know, whatever that person did to you, they at least didn't crucify you. And when Christ was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. So if, if Christ himself could forgive the people crucifying him, you certainly can forgive, by God's grace, whatever this person did to you. And that person looked at me as if I was totally nuts and said to me, Father, Tom, he was God. I'm just a human being. Well, I had to inform her, so was he a human being, a real human being whose life was to be imitated and actualized and perfected, and that's the reason that he came. <laughs> so functionally, a lot of us, especially Orthodox, probably most Catholics too, they usually think of Jesus as God. And then sometimes they'll even identify Jesus just with God in general. God became a man. God was born. God in a cavern. God. But as a matter of fact, that is not totally accurate either. <laughs> Because Jesus is not the one true God. Jesus' Father is the one true God. <laughs> the one true God is God the Father. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. <laughs> he is of the same nature of God because He receives His divinity eternally in the timeless generation from the Father. He is begotten of the Father. The Nicene Creed said He is God from God, divine from the divine one, just like the Holy Spirit is in the Spirit's procession. But the Holy Spirit and the Son of God are divine with the divinity of the one God and Father. And in the Scripture, the New Testament particularly, the one God is almost always God the Father. In fact, in the Scripture, Jesus is only really called God twice, except if you look at some punctuation in some of St. Paul's letters. And we heard it in the last week in the Orthodox Church with the, old, with the old Paschal calendar, when he's identified with the Logos of God, and it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in the poetic inclusion of St. John's Gospel, at the end when the Logos incarnate has gone through his ministry and was crucified and raised, Thomas, my patron saint, was my name day yesterday, the 64th anniversary of my baptism, um, is the only one in the scripture who says to Jesus, my Lord and my God, with a definite article in Greek, ho theos ke ho kyrios mu, the Lord and the God of me. So Jesus is God from God. He is divine with the Father's divinity. And only one of the Holy Trinity is incarnate. Not the Father, not the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the Holy Spirit is never called God, not only in the Scripture, but not in the first 350 years of Christianity. It was Gregory the theologian who finally said in one of his orations, I think on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is God. There, I've said it. <laughs> Athanasius wrote letters to Serapion on the Holy Spirit, never calling him God. Basil the Great wrote a whole treatise on the Holy Spirit, never calling him God. So we have to be accurate in what we think and say. Now we believe that the Son and the Holy Spirit are God. They are divine. Just like I am human, my wife is human. You know, as a predicate nominative, you can say, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But you cannot say God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Spirit. It's as if there were one God who is the Father, who is the Son, who is the Holy Spirit. That is the heresy of modalism. A condemned heresy. Sabellian, Paul of Samosata, modalism. Condemned by the ecumenical councils. Now, so I think we've got to get it straight. And hopefully we'll try a little bit to get it straight. But I am emboldened also... Uh, in doing this tonight, and hopefully maybe writing it up if it turns out okay. Um, um,
to try to shed more light on this mystery of Christ, the divinity and humanity in the one person of the incarnate Son of God, born of Mary. I'm emboldened also by uh, words of St. Gregory the Theologian. In the first theological oration, at the end of it, the first of the five famous ones that he gave in Constantinople, you know, when the whole world was Arian, uh, he, um, he has this sentence. He says, When the dogmas are sound, when the theology statements are clear, when the knowledge of the scripture is adequate, then he said, he used the verb to philosophize, to philosophize about the creation or the suffering of Christ or the crucifixion or the economia, and this is the exact words, he said, to, to do this uh, on such subjects as these is welcome because to hit the mark is not useless and to miss it is not dangerous. So if we miss the mark tonight, Gregory says, it's not dangerous. We just wasted an hour. Some people didn't get the sleep they need and we can carry on. And I'll take my honorarium. <clears throat> um, <laughs> But he also says to hit it is not useless. It's beneficial, it's helpful if we can get it right. So I'm going to begin uh, my talk tonight, formally now, with a cursory review of the great controversies about Jesus Christ from earliest Christianity to the end of the first millennium. I'm going to do this quickly, but I'm doing it for a very important reason. The reason is <clears throat> and we should note this that almost all of the heresies about Jesus certainly every single one of them that was dealt with by one of the seven ecumenical councils with the exception of the Arian controversy which I'll talk about a little bit they were all heresies denying the real humanity of Jesus. <laughs> Every single one compromised the real humanity, not the divinity. You see, we are used to always have to defend nowadays the divinity of Christ. Most folks, uh, you know, would think maybe Jesus was a good man, a nice man, merely a man, but they wouldn't say that he is really divine. And we hold that he is really divine. And so we defend properly, we should, his divinity. Although there was this British guy I met one time who said, Why, Father Tom, I would never deny the divinity of Jesus. I wouldn't deny the divinity of anyone. <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> well, the only ones that we think are divine are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No one else is divine. But in any case, it's interesting to note that through history, beginning with the scriptures, the greater concern was to defend the fact, the conviction, that Jesus was a real man, a real human being. And it's important for us because it's not only important for our faith, because it is as much a dogma that Jesus is a man as it is that he is God. <laughs> That's very important. But it's very important also for our humanity to understand how he is a human being and how his divinity deifies the humanity so that in and through him by the Holy Spirit's power we could become divine ourselves by grace. It's very important. It's critical to our faith. It's, it's our faith itself. <laughs> Extremely important. So as one fellow once also said, an Englishman, he said, those of us who believe in the divinity of Christ must never, ever, ever surrender his humanity to those who don't. For us, he is as much man as he is God. And here our theological tradition would certainly hold that if he is not really divine, we are not saved and he cannot save us. Because if he is not really divine, he's got to be saved himself. If he's a mere man, psilos anthropos, gymnos anthropos, just a man, like the Jesus superstar opera used to sing, he's just a man, he's just a man. Well, he is a man. 
But he's not just a man. Because if he were just a man, merely a man, then we wouldn't be saved either. So to use fancy language, because this is an academic convocation, if the divine hypothesis of the Logos did not end hypothesize the real human thesis of, of humanity with all of its energies, powers, operations, and idiomata, then soteriologically the gospel fails. Which simply means, if he ain't God and man, we ain't saved. If he doesn't have all the properties of divinity and all the properties of humanity in one person, we are not saved. But we claim that he has both. Then the question is, how does it work? How does it work? How does it work in him? And how does it work for us? Now, I mentioned that <clears throat> I'll begin by just pointing out to refresh the memory of all those who have studied theology formally that the first Christian heresies about Jesus, Christian heresies, I'm not speaking about non-Christians who didn't believe in Christianity at all or Jews who did not accept Jesus as the Messiah or whatever, uh, but virtually all the Christian heresies, except certain Judeo-Christian heresies that did exist, Ebionites and so on, who said that he is the Jewish Messiah but he's not the incarnate Son of God. But virtually all those that came from Hellenism um, and almost all of them did, <laughs> um, they actually deny his real humanity. First of all, the Gnostics and the Docetists believe that Jesus only appeared to be human. He was not really human. Because they thought that anything human or material or temporal is no good. The perfect is divine, unchanging, spiritual, not material. Just being and not becoming cannot change. And, and, and certainly cannot be caught up in human flesh and certainly cannot die a bloody corpse on a cross. Uh, that can't be. And by the way, Islam holds the same thing. <laughs> Islam holds the same thing. Islam believes in the virgin birth. The Koran teaches the virgin birth. But they don't believe that Jesus is really divine and they don't believe that he really died. <laughs> well, either did a lot of early Christians. <laughs> So already in the New Testament, you have St. Paul speaking about Christ in the days of his flesh. He became like his brethren in every respect except sin. And sin is, doesn't belong to humanity. Sin is alien. It is, not a sin, it is not synonymous to be human and a sinner. Just the opposite. Sin dehumanizes us. We're going to see that tonight. Or Paul in Colossians who would say, In Jesus dwelt pleadamo theotitos somatikos. The fullness of divinity, sarkically, fleshly, somaticos even is rather bodily, bodily. But John insists on the flesh. In the first letter of John, the second letter of John, uh, the author there says that if anyone does not confess that Christ has come en sarhi, though those who do that are deceivers and are antichrists and are without God. That's what it says. <laughs> Who deny that Christ really has come sesarkomeni, enfleshed, as the Nicene Creed says, that he, be, he was incarnate and an anthropisanta, became human. That's our faith. So already in the Bible, that had to be defended. Then the apostolic fathers were defending it all the time against all types of Valentinians, Gnostics, uh, Vassalidians, all these kind of people who said, Christ is some kind of spiritual aeon. He inhabits Jesus, but Jesus doesn't really die. And when we all uh, finally go to heaven, we lose all our body and we turn into souls. Origen taught that. <laughs> and it was rejected by the church. Then you had, in going historically, the Arian heresy. And many people today would say, oh, the Arians are really like modern Christians who deny uh, the divinity of Christ and think that he is merely a man. And how often I've heard people say about people who reject the divinity of Christ, oh, they're just Arians. Well, brothers and sisters, that ain't accurate. That is not accurate. Because the Arian heresy did not have to do with Jesus the man. It had to do with the Logos, Son of God eternally. The Arians believed that Jesus Christ was the incarnate Son of God. But they didn't believe that the Son of God was divine eternally. They didn't believe that God's wisdom and word were divine. 
They thought that the Christ was the greatest of the creatures, the first creature made, God's logos, God's wisdom, God's power, God's glory, but he was a creature. He was called into existence out of nothing. He was a ketisma. And then through him, the one God, who is a monad God, not a Trinitarian God, uh, creates everything. So the Arians believed that Jesus was the first of creatures, the best of the creatures, the great witness of the glory and power of God. He was the one by whom, through whom, for whom all things were made, but his divinity was not identical to that of the one God and Father. So as a matter of fact, the only Arians around today that I know of are Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> because the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ is the Logos of God, the Son of God, the first created uh, being of God and the highest of all creatures, who can even somehow be called divine, but not divine with the same divinity, identical divinity as God. Once two Jehovah Witnesses came to my door when I was teaching dogmatics at the seminary, so I invited them to my class. <clears throat> and when they gave their spiel, all our students said, Father, they're Aryans. I said, yep, they are. <clears throat> so technically Arianism doesn't have anything to do with the humanity of Jesus in fancy language it's a triadological heresy not a Christological heresy it has to do with the Trinity not with the person of Jesus now if you go all the rest of them though have to do with the person of Jesus after Arianism the Apollinarian said the Logos became flesh but he didn't have a human mind he didn't have a human soul he didn't have human uh, intelligence he didn't have a human noose the Logos of God inhabited a body, and he took a body like an instrument. So he really didn't have a human soul, a human mind. He wasn't really fully human. And that occasioned St. Gregory the Theologian to say, the famous line that every seminarian knows, what is not assumed is not saved. What is not assumed is not healed. If he does not have a human mind, a human soul, a human feeling, human passions, human will, he's not human. He's a freak. And that was condemned as a heresy. A heresy. But a lot of folks usually think of Jesus like that. He's sort of the divine logos masquerading around like a man, but not a real one. That is not right. He's a real man. He has a mind. He has a soul. He has a will. He has emotions. He has a body. He has passions. He has sexuality. He has a nationality. He's a Jew. Still bothers a few Ukrainians, I know. <laughs> um, um, uh, <clears throat> You know, um, <clears throat> but he has everything that belongs to human nature. And so finally, the, 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 the controversy went on. And then there were people who were called Nestorians. <laughs> and those people said they were so strictly Nicene, so insisting that Jesus Christ, uh, excuse me, that the Logos of God, the Son of God, was really divine, that they ended up denying that he could become a man. <laughs> they said if he's really divine, then he's immutable, unchangeable, eternal, perfect. He can't become a man. He can't become anything. <laughs> he's stuck in his divinity. <laughs> he's like imprisoned in his divinity. He cannot actually, he himself, as a person, be born as a man. And that's why they wouldn't call Mary Theotokos. <laughs> which was a liturgical title for a century already. In fact, long before the Nestorian controversy, Gregory the theologian said, anyone who does not confess the incarnate son of uh, uh, Mary, the mother of the incarnate son of God as Theotokos, is severed from the Godhead. They are not in communion with God. So it was an old term. And Nestorius caused the whole problem when he dropped the term Theotokos from the liturgy. It was being used in the liturgy, he dropped it. He said, this is not right. So when you start changing stuff in the liturgy, you better be careful, you know. Now, that wild man among the fathers, Cyril of Alexandria, went crazy. And he said, who then is born of Mary? Well, the Nestorian answer was, the man Jesus. And there was a synathia, a conjunction between the Logos of God and the man Jesus forming the Christ. So Christ was his prosopon, his person, his face to the world, was a, a synathia, a joining of the Logos of God and the man Jesus, or the Son of God and the Son of Mary. And that's where Cyril of Alexandria said, 
The Son of God, the Son of Mary, the same Son. The one born of Mary is the Logos himself. The Logos did not join himself to a man. The Logos became a man. <laughs> and that's why the Third Ecumenical Council in Ephesus in 431 insisted on Theotokos and justified the theology of Cyril. But then you have Chalcedon 30 years later because they're still fighting about all this. And so some folks were saying, okay, okay, the word of God really became human, but because he's so powerfully God, he basically overwhelms the humanity of Christ and the humanity is just an external instrument of the Logos who sort of goes around pretending that he's not God. Because if he's divine, then his humanity is swallowed up in his divinity. And then the council and the father said, oh no. He became human and the humanity remains fully human. The humanity is deified by his divinity, not suppressed or destroyed. When the Logos becomes man, he doesn't destroy his humanity, he, he divinizes it. <laughs> he glorifies it. He's a real human being, being real God together. And he reveals his divinity through his real humanity. Well, then they said, well, then he's not really human. He's a divine, he's a divino-human nature. He has a theandric thesis. He's just theanthropic. He's just a God-man. The council said, oh, no. There ain't no such thing as a theanthropic nature. You can be divine and you can be human, but you can't be divino-human. <laughs> A person can be divine and human, and Jesus is. But there is no such nature as divino humanity. It doesn't exist. And if it did exist, well, it can't exist, uh, because how can divine be fused with the human and lose the characteristics of divinity? It's absurd, and it's certainly not biblical. It's an ontological impossibility. That's why the monophysites were rejected at Chalcedon and the Eutychians and all these other folks that you might learn about if you go to the degree-granting seminary of Cyril and the Thotes. <laughs> um, this is, and this is important. But then there were even some who said, well, okay, he became a man, but because his humanity was so perfectly divine, it was incapable of dying. Just for the fun of it, I'll tell you what those people were called. They were called Aftartodocetists. <laughs> Julian of Halicarnassi. And the point there was, there ain't any humanity that's incapable of dying. If you're a human, you're capable of dying. That's a, that's, a, that's a characteristic of being human. If you break communion with God, you die. Period. So humanity as a creature is capable of dying. They said Jesus was capable of dying. But then there were some who said, well, okay, he has divinity and humanity, but it's so united together, so inseparably united, that all of his actions are theandric or theanthropic, divino human. And again, the Holy Father said, oh, no. <laughs> And here we finally had a good chance where Maximus the Confessor, who was just a mere lay monk in the East, got together with the Pope of Rome, Martin, and defended the truth that Jesus has a human will, human energies, human operations, human activities, and all the characteristics of humanity, as well as all the characteristics of divinity. And Maximus was thrown into jail. And they cut off his tongue, and they cut off his arm, and they said he was wrong. And then the Sixth Council said... He was right. And they posthumously anathematized both Sergius, the Patriarch of Constantinople, and Honorius, the Pope of Rome. And when I remember that, it makes me particularly happy tonight. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the Pope and the Patriarch were wrong, and these men were right. And it's affirmed by the Ecumenical Council. And then, of course, the iconoclasm, we usually think it had to do about icons. In fact, it had to do about the humanity of Jesus. Because the iconoclast said, you can't make an image because he's divine. He's the divine logos. If you paint it, you're only painting his humanity. So you're a Nestorian. And the answer was, oh, no, no, you're a Nestorian. <laughs> because the word really became flesh, and we beheld his glory. We saw him. In St. John's Gospel, Jesus says, when Philip says to him, show us the Father. Jesus gets angry. He gets mad. He said, have I been with you so long you still don't understand? He who sees me sees the Father. He who sees me sees the Father. How can you say show us the Father? And therefore the Apostle Paul in two places, 2 Corinthians 4, Colossians 1, calls Jesus the Theou, 
the icon of God, the obras Boji. In Colossians, it's even the ikon tu theu tu auratu, the icon of the invisible God. And Irenaeus already in the second century said, in Christ, the invisible becomes visible. The uncontainable becomes containable. The uncircumscribable is circumscribed. The eternal becomes temporal. The divine becomes human. We have a real incarnation of the real Son of God, who is the real Son of Mary, who is a real divine person, who becomes a real human being, and therefore, and here's a controversial point, all the watchdogs of orthodoxy, take out your pencils right now. Because I think, if that's all true, then we have to say Jesus is a human person. Now, traditionally, our theologians would never say Jesus was a human person. They would say he's a divine person with a divine nature who assumes the human nature, and the human nature is enhypostasized in his divine person. Now, the reason why most people wouldn't want to say that was because they were afraid of Nestorianism, afraid of saying that Jesus of Nazareth was someone other than the Son and Word of God. But I would like to defend tonight that if the second person of the Holy Trinity really is incarnate and becomes human, as the creed says, and really has all the fullness of human nature with all its actions, operations, characteristics, and properties and attributes, then as a matter of fact, he becomes a human person too. Because the human nature with all its energies are enhypostasized in him. And the later Byzantine theology, like Leontius of Byzantium and others, they spoke of a synthetos hypostasis, a synthetic hypostasis. In other words, one person with the two natures. The Nestorian heresy would be two persons in one prosopon joined together. The joining of the Son of God and the Son of Mary. The joining of the Logos and the man Jesus. But there is another joining, a synathia of divinity and humanity in the one person. Now, of course, he is eternally divine. Of course, he becomes man of Mary. But once he becomes human, you must say he's a human person. And the Bible speaks that way. The man, Jesus. One mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus. Behold, the man. And he appears in the pages of the Gospels as a man, first of all. And here I would make a point that unless a person encounters Jesus of Nazareth as a man, they will never know him as God. Why? Because his divinity is revealed through his humanity. And he appears to us. He is incarnate. He shows himself. He speaks to us. He acts to us humanly. Perfectly, totally humanly. But he who is acting that way is the Son of God. But in that activity... He literally becomes also a human person. Or as my professor of dogmatics would say, Father Tom, don't say that. You're going to get yourself in trouble. But I think you're right. Well, I'm old enough not to care about if I'm in trouble or not. When you get my age, you just think about other problems. But the other thing is this. My professor said, if we don't say that he becomes also a human person without ceasing to be the divine person because it's the same person of the Son of God, we must still insist that he functions completely and totally as a human person. The subject of his activity is, is activity that is really human. Now, in the scripture, of course, Jesus appears as a man, and the main question that we would have there, we can find in John 10, 33, Every time I start speaking, I always mix up my papers. But in John 30, 10, 33, it says, they said about Jesus, when Jesus was speaking and, and, and they were trying to kill him, you know, they tried 11 times to cast stones at Jesus as a blasphemer. And by the way, Jesus died as a blasphemer. He did not die claiming to be Messiah. Every other Jew thought they were the Messiah. I mean, um, his, his crime was... Officially, that he is king of Israel, but he was put to death out of the envy of the high priests with the collusion of the Romans. And the reason, at least in St. John's Gospel, when he is trying to kill him, he says, for what good work are you wanting to kill me? And by the way, we sing about that in our Holy Week. In the hymns of Holy Week, we say, 
Why are you wanting to kill me? Is it because I opened the eyes of the blind? Is it because I fed the hungry? Is it because I clothed the naked? Is it because uh, I, 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 uh, I cast out the demons? For what good work are you killing me? And the answer is given in John's Gospel where it says, It is not for a good work that we stone you, but for blasphemy. For you, being a man, make yourself God. That you are a man who acts like God. St. Athanasius the Great, commenting on this rhetorically, said, If only they would have known that the question should have been placed otherwise. How can you, being God, make yourself man? (laughs) Because that's the mystery that's ultimately revealed that he is God before the ages who appears on earth. But existentially, it's a man that you meet, and you say, how can this man make himself God? Now, here it's very important for us to know that this insistence on the real humanity is the biblical teaching. He is a man, a real, true man, human, just like you and I are. If he's not then we're not saved. If if he's not, the Gospels, the Bible is not teaching the truth because it presents him as a real man. But the question is, what manner of man is he? You had that already in Matthew and Mark and Luke. He forgives sins in his own name. He casts out demons in his own name. When people fall down and worship him, he doesn't say, get up, I'm just a man. He says, you believe in God, believe in me. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. I mean, those are divine Uh, pretensions he gives a teaching and begins by saying amen amen I say to you in old English it was verily verily I had a neighbor up in Warren when we lived there in the 60s and her daughter's name was verily and I said Mrs. Brown what's your daughter's name verily verily reverend Uh, she said don't you know the Bible and I says what do you mean she says it's written verily verily I say to you (laughs) Um, so this little girl was named verily um (laughs) In Greek and Slavonic, it's amin. Amin, amin, legoimin. No one in the scripture begins the teaching saying amin first. You're supposed to say amin to what the guy says. See, I'm hoping very much you're going to say amen to what I'm saying tonight. <laughs> um, but if you're the incarnate son of God, you can say amin, amin, legoimin. Truly, truly, I say to you. In other words, this ain't up for negotiation. This is the word of God. And Jesus said, I have no words but the words of the Father. I have no will but the will of the Father. I have no work of the work of the Father. I and the Father are one. Although being God's Son, he can also say the Father is greater than I. And by the way, in a lot of our theology catechisms, when Jesus says the Father is greater than I, most people explain it as the fact that he's human. You can say, oh yeah, the Father is greater than him because he's human. I got news for you. That ain't what the Cappadocian fathers taught. Gregory and Gregory and Basil said, If he was just a man and said, the Father is greater than I, you could say to him, no kidding. (laughs) Suppose I got up here and said, folks, uh, the Father is greater than I. You say, where's the local hospital? (laughs) But the Cappadocians say, when Jesus says the Father is greater than I, you can only have a comparison between beings of the same nature. And so they said, although his nature is divine with identically that of the Father, his personal relation to the Father as the Son allows him to say that by manner of origin, the Father is greater than I because the pigitheotis, the source of his divinity, the etia, the cause of his divinity, is God the Father. He is divine because he is God's Son in word. He is God from God who becomes man. Now, in the, in the Gospels, he is a man. He walks around like a man, a first century Jew. And he has all the characteristics of what it means to be a human being from the moment of his conception. He's an embryo. He lives exactly nine months in Mary's womb. Unlike the Virgin Mary and John the Baptist, by the way. Because if you notice our liturgical year, each of their conceptions is off by one day to their birth, just to show they weren't perfect in the Son of God, you know. Um, But for Jesus, it's perfect. March 25th to December 25th. April 7th to January 7th for some in the room. Um, it's exactly nine months, but he's a perfect embryo. Then he is born like any child is born. He opens the mother's womb. There's a piety about this closed womb we may talk about, but according to the scripture, he is born as a real human being. 
in the Bethlehem cave. He is washed by midwives on the icon. The birth is not gnostic. It's a real birth. Then he's a real baby. He's a real infant. He grows up in his humanity, the scripture says, deifying all the stages of human development, St. Irenaeus would say. There's an anakephaleosis in his humanity. He recapitulates every part of human life. He deifies it as he lives it through. But it's a real human life, which means that he had limitation, nationality. Uh, uh, he had to learn. I, I said recently in the talk and got attacked by saying Jesus of Nazareth was ignorant. He did not know Church Slavonic. <laughs> Although some people think he knew Greek. <laughs> um, but if he knew it, he learned it. Jesus does not have infused knowledge. He learns like any human being learns. He's got to come to even learn who he is. He's got to learn by the time he's 30, or by the time he's 12, he learns that he's got a special calling, his father's business. By the time he's 30, he's got to know that he's the Messiah. Perhaps he didn't realize fully the implication of being God's son until he was raised and glorified from the dead. You know, the full implication, I mean. Because he had a human brain. He had human ways of learning. He was a real human being. Real human beings are not omniscient. <laughs> They're not. Now, sometimes people would think, well, when Jesus was a little baby, maybe somebody was looking at him and saying, oh, isn't he cute? And then they imagine Jesus inside his mind going, ha, 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 if they only knew that I was the incarnate Logos. You know. <laughs> and, then, and then all of a sudden, out of the, the Bethlehem manger, he would stand up and go, peace be to all, or something. God, forgive me for verging on blasphemy. Forgive me, but I want to make this point strongly. Real babies don't do that. Real babies are real babies, and he was a real baby. He sucked Mary's milk. He was obedient to his parents. He worked. He studied. He grew. He's a real human being. Now, by the time he has his ministry, however, as a man, he is... Um, demonstrating all the qualities of God. All the qualities that are given to God in the, in the Old Testament, the Law, the Psalms, and the Prophets, are now given to Jesus, the man Jesus. He speaks in his own name. He forgives sins in his own name. Who can do that but God? He casts out demons and has power over all the evil powers in his own name. He heals the blind. He makes the deaf to hear, the, the, the lame to walk, the dumb to talk. He does it himself and says, I can show you that I have this power. And then he walks on the water and he calms the winds and he, and he calms the waves and he feeds the people in the wilderness. And, and, and then he does the ultimate act. He raises the dead. Who has power over life and death? God alone. But he does this in and through his humanity. He does this as a man. And that's the point, that the divinity of Christ, which is the identical divinity of God the Father, is revealed through Him in human form. St. Paul says, although He was en morphi, to theu, in the form of God, He was found in homiomata, to anthropo, in the likeness of man. And He took on the form of the slave, and was obedient to death. We're going to get to that. I'm running out of time here. We'll get to that. But what we have to see in his humanity is the humanity, and this is the main point I want to make tonight, the humanity of Christ doesn't conceal his divinity. It reveals his divinity. It doesn't hide his divinity. It shows his divinity. And, he, and, and, it's, and, and, and it's done in authentically human way because he's a real man. And as a matter of fact, it can't be done any other way. Even the hesychastic communion of the divine energies according to the fathers come to us through Christ and through his glorified flesh. Even proleptically to Moses, it is Jesus Christ that he encounters in the bush, the one who is Mary's child. There is no ansarchic logos floating around. 
The creed doesn't say, I believe in the Logos who became man. It says, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. Light from light, true God of true God, begotten, not made. And so from all eternity, we contemplate the second person of the Trinity as Mary's child. The one who we'll see was crucified. Now, so Jesus, and this is the gospel itself. The gospel itself is that the man, Jesus, has all the characteristics of the one true God, his Father. He has them being the Father's Son, and Logos, and Wisdom, the Var Yagveh, Chochmah Yagveh, Sophia Tutheyu, Logos Tutheyu. The, 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 he, he is everything that He is from the Father, and then that is even be born in human flesh as Mary, and then realized in human form shown in human form so that when you hear him you hear God when you see him you see God when you touch him you touch God when you smell him you smell God but God ain't touchable smellable seeable a man is so there can be a man that God has become when we eat the body and blood of Christ it's the body and blood of God incarnate it's God's body and blood Saint Cyril would say not some man that the Son of God joined himself to but nevertheless it's body and blood and God doesn't have body and blood. Man has body and blood. But there can be human body and blood that is the body and blood of God. That's our faith. Now, the last thing, mostly because of time, <laughs> is that <clears throat> we believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Mary's child, not only became human, in order to reveal God to us. But he became a slave. A bonded, suffering slave. He became the Ebed Yaakveh of Isaiah, the suffering servant. And he came in order to suffer and in order to die. And here's the most mind-blowing part of it all. His divinity is perfectly revealed and realized in his suffering and in his death. If he did not suffer and he did not die, he not only would not save the world, but he would not reveal God to us. We know who God is and how God is and what God is. And St. John Chrysostom would have even said, we know where God is. <laughs> in the crucified Christ. As the Christ, Jesus had to die. We believe that. That's our faith. In order to save the world, and therefore in order to reveal God, and therefore in order to live a human life that is fully and completely divine, he had to suffer and die. Why? Why? And here, I think the answer is best put by in the following way. If it isn't, well, that's the way I decided to do it. In his humanity, the incarnate Son of God is the Messiah. The Messiah, the anointed, was the last great prophet, the last priest and the last king. First of all, he was the prophet. He was the prophet, and a prophet is the person who proclaims fully and completely the word of God. Now we believe that Jesus was the final prophet. St. Peter spoke about this on the Sermon on Pentecost, where he said, Moses wrote that a prophet will arise, that if you do not listen to him, you're cut off from the people. You have no hope. When John the Baptist is asked, are you the prophet? He says, no. Although Jesus said he was the last and finest and greatest of all the prophets. Except for the Messiah. The Messiah is the prophet. Just like he is the son of God and the son of man and the word of God. Definite articles all the time. Not a son of God, the son of God. Not a word of God, the word of God. Himself in his own person. But he becomes the prophet. Now, what does the final prophet have to do? The final prophet has to speak the final word of God. And we claim here 
that this is Jesus, not Muhammad, and that this final prophet is the word of God himself in human form. And we know that the word, word in Hebrew, davar, it doesn't mean only a spoken word, it means an act, it means a thing. He is God's final thing. He's God's final act. He's God's final word. He has to say it all. He has to show it all. He has to do it all. And what is the all that he has to do? He's got to reveal God completely, fully, and finally on the planet Earth and recreate the whole creation. And he's got to do it only how it can be done, by humiliation and death. Because the prophet has to die, first of all. They all do. But the other thing is this. In the final time, like we sing with the three youths in the fiery furnace, that when that final age comes that Daniel predicts when the Son of Man is, is given up to the Son of God and receives glory, honor, dominion, and majesty. We just did it last Saturday in our church, a week ago Saturday. Shadrach in the fiery service, furnace gets up and play, says, We are come fewer than any nation. All this is upon us because of our sin. And then he says, There is no prophet. And when we say that on Great and Holy Saturday, we mean it. Because the prophet is dead. And in the Slavic churches, the epitaphios is still out there. In the Greek church, it disappears on Friday night. In the Russian and Slavic Ukrainian churches, it's still there. So you're saying there is no prophet over the dead Jesus. Because it's true, he's dead. There is no prophet. But the prophet has to die because the prophet has to show who God is, what God is. And God is love. God is truth. God is, is compassion. The Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He does not hold our sin against us. He dies for us. So for the prophet to be and reveal the final word of God, he has to die. Because God, who is love, has to love us to the end. And he loves us to the end in the son of his love, who is Jesus the man, the messianic prophet, who dies because he loves his people to the end and therefore reveals God in his death. God is revealed in his death. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Paul in Philippians says he was obedient even unto death, death on a cross, the shameful death. He had to be in order to reveal God. Then his, he was not only the prophet, he was the priest, the great high priest. As the great high priest, he also has to die. Why does he have to die? Because the final great high priest has to offer the perfect sacrifice. He's got to offer the perfect victim. He's got to make the offering to God that forgives all the sins, wipes out all the iniquities, gets rid of all the guilt, you know, uh, reconciles all those who are alienated and recreates the whole creation. So as the great high priest, he has to die. He's got to die in human flesh. And the offering has to be himself. The same way as the prophet, he is the word and the disciple. As the high priest, he's also the victim, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice. He is the one, as we say in our liturgy, who offers and is offered, who receives the offering, and the offering itself is distributed to us. And so in his death, as the great high priest, he reveals the divinity of God the Father. He does the all-encompassing, merciful act of God by offering the perfect sacrificial offering for the life of the world. And then he's the king. Even on the cross it says, king of the Jews. That's the, that's, the, that's the crime. King of the Jews. Written in four different ways on the four different crosses in the four different gospels, by the way. <laughs> but everyone has that word, king of the Jews. But in our church we put the word king of glory. Ivasiles tis doxis. Not ivasiles ton judeon. Because he is the king of glory of the Psalms. But what is the king? The king is the victor. The king is the one who makes victory for his people. And he could only be victorious, Jesus Christos Nika, which we have on our church bread and on our vestments, by dying. Because he's got to trample down death by death. Because it's the only way it could be trampled down. He's got to defeat the final enemy. There's only one war on the planet earth that's interesting. It was fought by one person, Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, and it was won when he surrendered himself to death. He says, I could call 12 legions and angels and wipe you all out. George Bush, Cheney, Osama, and whoever notwithstanding. <laughs> but he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it. When they say, come down from the cross if you're the messianic son of God. He doesn't do it. 
If he does it, he would lose the war and he would not be the messianic king. So he reveals the messianic glory by being crucified. And that's why we start our 12 Gospels with the words of John 13, 31. Now is the Son of Man glorified and God is glorified in him. So the cross reveals the glory of God, the power of God, the mercy of God, the wisdom of God. It reveals God. When we see Jesus hanging silent on the cross or lying dead in his tomb keeping the Sabbath, when God is resting from all his works on that Sabbath seventh day, then God activity on earth is perfected. It is fulfilled. Not simply it is finished, meaning he's dying. The word means it is accomplished. It is all done. It is perfected. Everything that can possibly be done is done. Everything that can be revealed is revealed. Everything that can be shown is shown. Everything that can be said is said. And it's said in his death. So that's the paradox of all paradoxes. God is revealed as a corpse. That's our faith. That's our faith. And then you know there who God is, what God is like, how God acts. <laughs> you see, that's the revelation of the divinity through the humanity of Jesus. And then that means for us, that there's only one way to be deified and that is to be what he is and do what he does. Jesus said, those who believe in me will do greater works than I do because I go to the Father. He also said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. He also said, if you will be my disciple, you will take up your cross and follow me. And ultimately, he said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I, the Son of God, the Son of divine love, Paul even calls him that, St. Paul, in Colossians. Not the beloved son, but the son of love. And so he says to us, if you will be divine, then you have to love also to the end, even unto death. Because there's no other way to live a divine life on the planet Earth in its sinful, fallen form. No way. So, we believe that there is no exaltation without humiliation. There is no glory without total self-emptying. There is no riches without poverty. There is no wisdom without foolishness. You want to be first, you have to be the last. You want to be the greatest, you have to be the least. If you want to be rich, you have to be poor. If you want to be wise, you have to become a fool. If you want to be powerful, you have to become weak. If you want to live, you have to die. That's our faith. And all of this in the man Jesus is showing that he is God. The new Adam, the man from heaven. See, that's Paul's words. Because even the first Adam was only a type of him who was to come. Because Adam himself was created to be God's son, but he blew it from the beginning. But through Christ, we become God's son, and we even become deified. But we like that term, Orthodox, Eastern Christians, theosis. But the word for tonight is this. There is no theosis without kenosis. There is no deification without crucifixion. And the only way to be deified is to suffer in and with Christ in love for God with all one's mind, soul, heart, and strength and with love for the neighbor even unto death. Because that is the most perfectly divine act that can possibly be and it's accomplished humanly in the person of our Savior so that by faith and by grace and by the Holy Spirit, we could do the same. And therefore, to be katacharin, what he is katusian, to be by grace everything that he himself is by nature. And by nature, he is both God and man.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Father Thomas, for your energetic, enlightening, challenging, and passionate presentation. You do not disappoint us. So right now, while he gets his breath and a glass of water, you can think of the questions that you might want to raise for him for further clarification or elucidation. And if you would, Father Thomas, when someone asks a question for the sake of the recording, if you would repeat the question into the microphone, it would be helpful. Okay? Yep. Thank you. Yes, Father. Okay. Uh, I, I, maybe I'm just stuck in the person and the process of the place and then they just leave me off. I'm sitting here listening to you and thinking and just leave me in all kind of bypass. Could you clarify or uh, yeah. explain a little bit? I'd love to. I believe that in the metaphysics of the fathers, every being, whatever it is, whether it's a microphone, or God, schematically, is a hypothesis, a nature, and an energy. There's no such thing as a hypothesis that has no nature. What a thing is comes from its nature, not from its person or his hypothesis. And hypothesis technically is an instance of a nature. And some modern theologians like to think that there's some special meaning to hypothesis relative to human personhood. I think they're wrong. Gregory the theologian speaks about three golden rings as three hypostases. Three horses, three cows, three anything, three chairs. These are three hypostases. Why do I call each of them a chair? Because of their nature. What they are are chairs. This is a table. This is a wristwatch. I'm a human being. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are God. <laughs> now, how do you know what a nature is? The Father say, by its energies, by its operations, by its activities. That's why Jesus is confessed as God, because of his activities. Even if he was never called God at all. That's how Basil and Athanasius and so on defended the, the, the Godhood of the Holy Spirit, by his activity. He acts like God. This thing acts like a chair. This acts like a watch most of the time. Um, <laughs> You know, this acts like a microphone. I act hopefully like a human being. Maybe a sinful one, but still a human being. So when I'm saying what a thing is, it comes from its nature. If I say which one or who, that's its hypothesis. That's its person. Right? Following so far? Okay. Now, therefore, the only reason that we would call the Logos God is because it has a divine nature. <laughs> that's what it is. That's what a thing is. The only reason I would call Bishop and Father Guido and what's your name, lady? Writing, what's your name? Christy. I need to have a girl here, a woman. A bishop, a man, and a woman. Although bishops and priests we're not sure of, you know. It's like the Serbian statement. Here come two men and a priest. <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> But anyway, if I ask about Bishop, what is he? The answer is human. Man. If I ask about Father Guido, what is he? Human. If I ask about doctor, the doctor behind him, what is the doctor? He's human. What is Christy? Human. Why do I call them human? Because their, their nature and activity show me that they're human. But they are separate hypostases. But they have the same nature. All chairs have the same nature. All people have the same nature. All men and women have the same nature. There's only one human nature. There's only one divine nature shared by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's only one human nature shared by all human beings. There's only one chair nature shared by all chairs. Now, when you talk about creatures, you can count hypostases because nature for creatures is limited and finite and bound. So I could say, one, two, three chairs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven people. 
I can't say that about the Holy Trinity. I can't say three gods. Why? Because divine nature does not allow arithmetic. It has no bounds, therefore you cannot count. As Basil said, God is one by nature, not by number. And number does not apply to divinity. In fact, if we think there's one God like there's one chair or one book, we're wrong. <laughs> now, if that is true, and I hold that it is, then I believe that when the Logos enhypostasizes human nature and you ask, what is he? You can say, a man. The Bible does. Who is he? He is Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. What is he? He is divine and human. Now, if I say he's a divine person, because from all eternity he has the nature of the Father and is homoousios with the Father, why can't I say he is also a human person when he hypostasizes humanity and becomes the subject of human activity, which are integrated, generally, authentically human, for which the Holy Father suffered and died? Now, I said in my talk, my professor said, don't do it, Father Tom, because they'll accuse you of being a Nestorian. But the Nestorians united the person Jesus with the person of the Logos, and in fact, they said that there are two hypostases. There's a hypostasis of the Son of God, and there's a hypostasis of the Son of Mary, and they joined together in a synathia to form the prosopon of Christ. That is heretical. That is wrong. It's just plain stupid. It's not the Bible. It's not logical. But, if the Logos really becomes man and he becomes the subject, the hypokimenon of human activity, I see no reason why we cannot call him a human person. Now, one of the reasons, who is also the Son of God. In other words, the same person is both divine and human. If it's another one who's not the Logos, then you're in trouble. But if it's the Logos, why not? And I even think it's important for another reason. You know what it is? Even if you don't want to know, I'll tell you. It's because... Some good faith people criticize our orthodox theology, Catholic Orthodox Ecumenical Council theology, by saying, you folks don't really believe in the true humanity of Jesus. And you say, well, why not? They say, because you deny that he's a human person. You have divine person, divine nature, and he hypostasizes human nature, but he's still just a divine person who any, and he hypostasizes human nature. But you're, un, you're unwilling to say he then becomes a human person. And I would say, if you think that's so, you're right. We should say he becomes a human person. But there is no Jesus who is just human, who has only the human nature, doesn't exist. From the moment of his conception, Jesus of Nazareth is a human person who is also the divine person of the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. And there's one hypothesis. But Leontius of Byzantium dared to call it synthetos, synthetic. Synthetic means combining two. What are the two? Chalcedon says it's the two natures. Maximus died for saying it's the two natures with their proper energies. <laughs> you see? So I think that I don't recommend it, but I thought, you know, I would risk it. <laughs> so that if people would say, at least to me, and I'll tell you the honest truth, if I'm wrong, God forgive me, but if I meet a Protestant or someone who says patristic theology stinks, because they, they don't believe Jesus is a real human person, I would say, yeah, they really do. They're reluctant to say it because of Nestorianism, because of misunderstanding. But once a hypostasis becomes something, then that person is modified adjectivally by its nature. The only reason you can call Jesus a man is because he has human nature. The only reason you can call him God is because he has divine nature, the nature of the Father. But to say that Jesus is a divine hypostasis means you are already saying something about his nature. That's my point. Forgiveness to all of you who were lost ten minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you once again, Father Thomas, for all of your energetic presentation and for getting a lot of thinking stirred up and a lot of conversations. We invite you to continue the discussion and the conversations out in the a lobby area where we'll have a reception prepared for all of you to join. So thank you once again for being with us, and please stay and enjoy the reception and fellowship with each other. Thank you once again. <laughs>